Let's go straight into it then. Andrew's going to present uh, to us now. We're going to try and keep it to uh, 40 minutes. And if you can, if you have questions as he's talking, if you can just pop them in the chat, the Zoom chat, uh, then we've got obviously some of the co-authors, uh, Richard and Neil, uh, on hand to try and answer them live, as it were, but without disturbing Andrew's flow. And then save the bigger questions for the Q&A at the end, where hopefully we'll have a good 35 minutes. Um, uh, I've asked Eric to do a slightly more formal response to, to kick off that Q&A. So over to you. Um, thanks, Josh. Yeah, well, I, I, I'd like to say first, just thanks to Josh and Aska and I guess UCL more generally for uh, hosting us today. It's great to get an opportunity to share our research in this kind of forum, so it's um, much appreciated. Um, yeah, so uh, Richard, Neil and myself have been working on trying to understand the intricacies of the UK government's banking arrangements and financial activities for several years now, and that's culminated in the paper that we wrote that the first version was released uh, around Christmas, and the paper is essentially a walkthrough of various aspects of the government's financial activities, including spending, taxing, and securities trading. Uh, we present about 15 examples of distinct activities, both internal and external to the government, and track the specific transactions between the many parties involved using, using balance sheets. Um, now, this was a complex process for the reason that there are so many different institutions and entities involved. Um, and as we see it, that there wasn't, at least previously, um, a, a synthesis of how these different entities um, interact with one another. Instead, much of the publicly available information is very, very disparate and doesn't obviously indicate kind of how the whole system fits together. Um, and I guess the reason why this is potentially interesting or certainly interesting to us is that some of the conclusions that we've arrived at, uh, I guess, are very different to what is usually purported in mainstream discourse. Um, and hopefully that will be made clear as I go through. So I'll try to talk about a few of those some of the, the, the component, components of our paper and the conclusions that were led to. And uh, obviously myself, Neil and Richard are here for, for questions at the end. So I guess on the screen here, we have um, kind of a map, I guess, of, of some of the various institutions that are involved. Um, there's a lot more detail that can be drilled into, but for now there's, um, I guess probably two things that I'd like to emphasize. One is that the Bank of England sits at the interface of the, the public sector and the private sector. Now, obviously, the bank is wholly owned by the government. It's unquestionably, objectively part of the pu public sector. But it's indicated spanning the public and private sectors here because it really represents the, the interface between the two in a financial sense. Um, secondly, uh, the role of parliament, I would suggest, needs to be emphasized. Um, and I think we would probably say that it's commonly downplayed. Hopefully, as I get through, get through the slides, um, I can demonstrate how important it is to the government's financial activities. Okay, so first I'll just give a quick description of the private sector and its banking arrangements. Um, and I think that gives us, gives us a good foundation um, to look at how the government interacts with the private sector. So, so I think the first thing to consider here, and I should say, I'm probably not telling anybody anything new here, I imagine, but it, it, hopefully it sets the scene nicely. Uh, the first thing to consider, I think, is that there are different forms of money used in the private sector, which I'm sure we all agree with. Um, there are bank deposits that are issued by commercial banks, and these represent the main form of money that's used by individuals and businesses. But the central bank also issues money in the form of reserves and cash, and reserves uh, deposits held by commercial banks and which are used to settle transactions between banks. But we can also note that government securities uh, represented in, in these balance sheets here um, but as gilts um, are held by all of the different parties in the private sector. Um, they're held by the central bank to back the central bank's money issuance and used in monetary policy operations and therefore government securities are tightly coupled to what we think of as base money and they're also held by commercial banks um, and in that sense they're used as the medium of exchange for obtaining central bank reserves um, so in that respect 
um, government securities exhibit at least at least one of the crucial qualities of money that they act as a medium of exchange. Uh, government security is also held by non-banks though, um, and typically entities like pension funds. Um, and that's because they're the most secure alternative to other forms of money, um, for example, bank deposits. So in that sense, government securities also exhibit a store of wealth characteristic of money. So um, I think, yeah, I, th I, th I th I think what we'd, what, we'd, what we'd argue is that all of those things represent forms of money used by the, the private sector. Okay, so let's just look quickly at um, a private sector payment example. So um, in the top left, we've got a person A that is transferring money to a person B. Um, now the upshot of the transfer is that A's deposits are reduced and B's deposits are increased. We see that over on the top right. Um, but we additionally see that A's bank, Lloyd's in this case, loses central bank reserves and the recipient's bank, HSBC, gains, gains uh, reserve deposits because they were sent over to settle the payment. So one bank's balance sheet reduces and the other increases. Now on the bottom, we've got a slightly different scenario. In this case, the paying bank has insufficient reserve deposits at the, at the central bank to settle the payment. So in this case, the bank... Lloyd's in this case, um, draws upon its stock of government securities to obtain the reserves needed. Um, now there's a few mechanisms within the UK system uh, through which this could arise. One, for example, is collateralized intraday credit, but the upshot is that the securities have effectively paid to sell, being used to settle the payment. Okay, so we can now move into looking at the how the UK government interacts with this system. Um, so Parliament and what we can call the Exchequer are uh, connected in two ways. They're connected via the Treasury, HM Treasury, which coordinates the spending and taxation processes within Parliament and also administers what are known as the central funds. The central funds uh, serve to connect parliamentary legislation with the banking system. Um, and I think Two other components of this of, of the Exchequer are worth highlighting at this stage: government banking service and the debt management office. Um, now, I like to think of those as the, kind of the two interfaces um, with which the central funds um, interact with with the banking system. Um, government banking service involves um, government expenditure and revenue, such as tax, whereas the debt management office focuses on uh, securities trading. So what I'll do is I'll discuss these items on the right here in that list. Um, and I'll probably focus mostly on expenditure. And the reason for that is that um, some of the other processes, for example, um, borrowing, cash management and tax, um, are usually framed in terms of expenditure. Uh, you know, borrowing and tax are usually described in such a way that they are prov providing for government, providing for the government to be able to spend. Um, but once we describe how government actually spends, that helps to reframe those, those processes. Um, and so it, it makes sense to discuss expenditure predominantly and, and first, because then that helps to recontextualize some of the other things. Okay, so I'll just talk quickly about the central funds. So the central funds are kind of the legal and accounting structures uh, where most of most of the action happens. They're where all of government expenditure arises from. They're where government securities securities are issued from, and they're where the, they are the place that all taxation and other receipts um, head to. Um, we've got the consolidated fund, which acts kind of like the the government's current account, you could say. The national loans fund, uh, which issues um, what we tend to think of as government debt and also um, lends to public bodies such as local authorities. Uh, there's the contingencies fund, which is kind of like the emergencies fund and the exchange equalization account, which deals with foreign, foreign exchange. I won't talk about that at all. Um, I've also included the debt management account here though, which isn't technically a, one of the central funds, but it's kind of like a, like a, like a, a younger sister of the national loans fund, you might say. Um, and it's, it's useful to, to consider um, as one of the central funds, I think. Um, 
the central funds have been described in a debate in the House of Lords. They've been compared to the Holy Trinity and that they are jointly and severally incomprehensible. It is certainly true that they are complicated and mystifying to some extent. Uh, but I think the best way to understand them is, is, is kind of described on screen now, almost like a Russian doll. Um, the reason for that is that, well, the National Loans Fund uh, almost entirely funds the exchange equalization account and the debt management account. And the consolidated fund funds the National Loans Fund and the contingencies fund. So really, um, the, the, the consolidated fund is the backstop on the entire system. And if you understand the consolidated fund, uh, then I would argue you can understand the rest, um, which are essentially just kind of like sub entities for um, organizing the consolidated funds accounts. Okay, so what exactly is the con consolidated fund? Well, it was first set up in um, 1787 uh, as a, a fund into which shall flow every stream of public revenue and from which shall come the supply for every service. Um, it's governed by the Exchequer and Audit Departments Act 1866, which hopefully, as we'll see, is really quite fundamental to how the Exchequer operates. Uh, in 1968, the National Loans Fund was created, which split, which kind of split the consolidated fund into two. Um, uh, and, and from that point, that was from, from which the, the, the consolidated fund became effectively the, the current account of the United Kingdom Exchequer. Um, yeah, I, th I think um, it's worth saying right now that the Consolidated Fund and the National Loans Fund both hold accounts at the Bank of England, and they are both zeroed every night. And we'll see why and how that happens um, subsequently. But there's two other things to draw your attention to on, on screen here, and that is that the, the Consolidated Fund makes issues to finance supply services and standing services. So if we just look at the Exchequer and Audit Departments Act 1866, which governs the Consolidated Fund, we see that, um, well, firstly, there's a provision in there for to ensure that all government revenue goes into the Consolidated Fund. Uh, section 11 there, which is shown on screen there, um, uh, states that nothing shall be issued out of the consolidated fund that is not authorized by parliament, which is another really, really crucial um, clause in there. And then sections 13 and 15, they provide the, uh, the mechanisms by which the payments can arise out of the consolidated fund for standing services and supply services. So standing services are services that are permanently authorized by parliament by specific acts of parliament supply services are are services that are voted every year annually and i'll just show a few examples of those next so here's an example of a stand a consolidated fund standing service by virtue of the commissioners for revenue and customs act 2005 HMRC is entitled to pay out of the consolidated fund for several reasons, including payments into the National Insurance Fund or for tax repayments. So that, that form of issue out of the consolidated fund is permanently authorized. That is a consolidated fund standing service. Another example is the Contingencies Fund, uh, 1974. The Contingencies Fund can draw upon the consolidated fund in order to make emergency advances to to government departments. Again, that's permanently authorized by this act. Therefore, it's a consolidated fund standing service. By virtue of the Bank Act 2009, HM Treasury can draw upon the consolidated fund um, for purposes of in intervening in the banking sector um, in order to ensure you know, financial stability. Again, permanently authorized by this act, so a consolidated fund standing service. And finally, uh, the National Loans Act 1968 states that the net interest payments paid by the National Loans Fund, in other words, for interest on government debt, um, can be charged on the consolidated fund. So again, permanently authorized standing service. Um, now, in, con in contrast to that, we also have supply services and um, 
these are um, these are a little bit different. Uh, they're services that are voted annually, and they result in a Supply and Appropriation Act. Now, usually there are two Supply and Appropriation Acts each year, and th they can be considered to include authority for um, sort of routine expenditure of government. You know, the allowances of individual departments, health, education, defence, etc. Um, and so they're called supply services. Okay, so what's the significance of all of this? Right. Well, here I've shown the uh, the section 13 and section 15 from the Exchequer and Audit Departments Act 1866, which actually give the mechanisms by which um, payments are, are made. And I guess I've tried to capture this, the, the sequence on the left in the diagram. And so, so step one is the passing of legislation, which might be Supply and Appropriation Act, or it might be something more um, uh, more specific, a, a standing service. Uh, and then in step two, the Treasury requests money from the Comptroller and Auditor General. Now today, that role is the head of the National Audit Office. Uh, and this that, that request is shown in the diagram as step 2A. Um, so at that point, the Comptroller checks that the request for money by Treasury is consistent with the terms under which Parliament authorised the payment. That's step B. And if that's, that is true, then the Comptroller grants a credit to HM Treasury. In step four, um, this credit uh, can, be, can be cashed at the Bank of England and that results in an issue of money being made on the order of Treasury to a principal accountant. And I'll, I'll describe what that is in just a minute. Uh, uh, so the upshot of this sequence is that following parliamentary authority for expenditure, a cash balance is produced in an exchequer account by drawing on the consolidated fund account at the Bank of England. Uh, now, the consolidated fund starts every day with a, with a zero balance, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and regardless of that, orders for issues to be made out of the account can nevertheless be made. The account can have a negative balance, uh, and as is described in lots of documentation and, and also anticipated in the National Loans Act 1968, which is shown on screen there. And in fact, it routinely ends the day with a negative balance. So it, it follows that issues are made ostensibly as bank advances. The Bank of England issues money and, and, and that is balanced by a debt on the consolidated fund. Okay, so I'll now um, oh, skip too far ahead. Uh, I'll now describe um, government banking service, uh, which is the, the interface through which um, expenditure and revenue flows. So the government banking service was established in 2008 and replaced the office of Her Majesty's Paymaster General, which had operated for about 170 years I think, previous to that. Um, but like the Office, for Paymaster, Office of Paymaster General, uh, the government banking service operates very much like a bank. Departmental allowances are held um, in, a, in a ledger balance system, analogous to commercial bank deposits. Um, and government banking service holds underlying assets which are drawn upon in order to fulfill um, settlement into the banking system on behalf of uh, departments, much like commercial banks reserve accounts. Um, I guess it's important to say that government uh, government banking service does use commercial banking partners, um, NatWest for the expenditure accounts for most of the departmental accounts, and Barclays for for the receipt accounts, so HMRC and the DVLA. But settlement for for those payments, either going into the Exchequer or out of the Exchequer, is done using accounts held within the Exchequer at the Bank of England. So these are not. Well, I would argue they're not true commercial accounts. The commercial partners do not have responsibility for settlement, um, and therefore they're not they're not they're not commercial bank deposits. Instead, the commercial partners are providing uh, kind of front end retail banking banking transmission services. Okay, so just to try and describe the structure of government banking service a little bit more, um, we can start by showing the Bank of England here and a couple of commercial banks. Um, we can see how um, the, the banks are connected to their customers. 
um, but they're also connected to the Bank of England via their, their reserve accounts. Um, and this is how government banking service adds to the picture. Government banking service also has deposits, you could, you could call them. Uh, and these are shown split across um, many different holders representing government departments and other entities internal to government. Um, and these deposit accounts within government banking service are, are supported by two settlement accounts. Uh, actually more than two, but we're showing two here uh, as a simplification. Um, and these settlement, settlement accounts um, are at the Bank of England and represent the principal accountants that, uh, that I described earlier that are referenced in the, the 1866 Exchequer and Audit Departments Act. Um, so in this case, we've got an account for the, the Paymaster General and an account for the Commissioners for Revenue and Customs, which, which represent HMRC. And okay, so hopefully I can now describe how government expenditure works. Um, so the first step shown in the diagram here is, is the funding process where, whereby money is drawn from the consolidated fund and appears in the Paymaster General account. So that's what happens when, the, um, when those exchequer credits are cashed in at the bank um, and, a, and a balance is given to the Paymaster General. And so the next step, which is shown, I don't know if you see the change on the slide just there. The next step is that the Paymaster General can then use those balances to settle payments on behalf of departments into the banking system, much in the same way as any other bank would via accounts at the Bank of England. Notice, note that this diagram is only representing cash or sterling at the Bank of England. Um, so perhaps this next slide will um, will show the balance sheet impacts a little bit a little, a little bit better. Um, so this is hopefully going to try and describe the same process, but in a slightly different way. So if we look at the, if we look at the top left, um, we've got the starting balances for the consolidated fund account, the, the government banking service, paymaster general account, um, a department, a government department account, uh, and the Bank of England itself. Um, so notice that the bank has obviously reserve liabilities, um, but it also it also holds government securities as the balancing asset, and all the all the other accounts are zero at this point. So if we shift to the top right, we, we next we have the treasury requisition, which usually occurs on on, a, on about a monthly time scale. This is where the treasury requests money from Parliament, and the Comptroller and Auditor, Auditor General approves it and allocates credits, exchequer credits. So um, notice that it's government banking service that is holding these credits as an asset. Um, and these represent a claim over the consolidated fund. And so they appear as a liability for the consolidated fund. And since government banking service holds this asset, it's able to ledger credit deposits to the individual departments um, according to their, their allowances that are defined in the, in the Supply and Appropriation Act. So in step three, bottom left, um, cash is drawn from the consolidated fund. And this is, this is something that would occur on a daily basis um, according to anticipated cash flows. And this, this essentially involves government banking service swapping some of its exchequer credit assets for a cash asset in, in, the, in their Bank of England account. Uh, so we have a cash balance um, on one exchequer account but a cash debt on another. Uh, and this increases the overall size of, the, of the, the Bank of England's balance sheet at this stage during the day. Um, okay, and then the last step, step four in the bottom right, um, the cash balance that's held by government banking service in the, in the Paymaster General's account is used to settle departmental spending into the banking system. Um, notice that this uh, reduces the public deposit liabilities on the Bank of England's balance sheet, but it increases the reserve liabilities. That's that's really just a semantic difference in the sense that balances held by the government at the Bank of England are not described as reserves, they're described as public deposits. Um, and so at this point, the government banking service has shrunken its balance sheet, effectively use, using up some of the parliamentary credits while um, the Bank of England and the banking sector, which isn't shown uh, on here, have, have a have an expanded balance sheet. And that's all 
kind of balanced by a debt on the consolidated fund at this stage. Okay, so now we have, let's assume that that's the entirety of the day's activities, which is obviously quite unrealistic, but let's just assume that for argument's sake. Um, the Exchequer has an end of day process that seeks to rationalize all of the cash balances held. Now this doesn't affect, for example, the Exchequer credits held by government banking service or the, or the, the, the deposits held by government departments in, in government banking service. They are simply internal to the Exchequer but rather the, the consolidation which happens at the end of each day refers only to cash balances, i.e. The, the balances held at the Bank of England. Uh, so here's a kind of a diagrammatic representation of what happens at the end of each day. Uh, tax receipts are shifted into the consolidated fund uh, and the balance on the consolidated fund is then shifted into the National Loans Fund. Um, but the other thing that's shown on that diagram is that any remaining balances, cash balances held in government banking service are transferred directly to the National Loans Fund um, as overnight lending. Um, again, just try and show that in a slightly different form. Um, we can see that we have accounts held at the Bank of England, the Paymaster General account and the HMRC account, both part of government banking service, as well as the Consolidated Fund and the National Loans Fund. And all of those start every day with a zero balance. So the next step, number two, is a drawdown from the consolidated fund, and that results in equal and opposite balances on the consolidated fund and in the Paymaster General account. The consolidated fund being in debt, the Paymaster General account being in, in credit. And then in step three, the Paymaster General settles payments into the, into the banking system, and so its balance is somewhat depleted. Also during the day, HMRC may receive... Um, transfers into its settlement account in the Exchequer. That's step number four. And then at the end of each day in step number five, that those tax receipts are transferred to the consolidated fund. And they may have, they, well, they will have the effect of reducing that net debt or that, or that, that original debt um, on the consolidated fund. So then in step six, the Paymaster General's remaining balance has sh shifted to the National Loans Fund as an, as an overnight loan. And then finally, the Consolidated Fund is also shifted into the National Loans Fund. And what that results in is what is known as the net exchequer position. So it's the net balance of, of all of the cash accounts, the, the cash accounts at the Bank of England held by the exchequer. And in this case, it's a, it's a net deficit. Now, um, that net deficit also by accounting identity equals the net surplus that would be featured in the banking system itself. Okay, so now we can talk about something called the ways and means account. Um, so in the scenario that I've described so far, the exchequer, ex the, the exchequer has ended the day with a debt to the Bank of England, which is held on the National Loans Fund, having spent into the banking system. Uh, now, that there is a formal relationship between the bank and the National Loans Fund for, for recording such a debt, and it's called the Ways and Means Account. Now, it's, it's often construed as the government's overdraft facility, um, but it's really just another form of government security that can sit on the, the, the Bank of England's balance sheet um, backing the bank's money issuance. So in the example that I've described so far, uh, we could end it there by saying that the debt on the National Loans Fund simply becomes formalized um, on the Ways and Means account. Now that's not typically what happens um, because there is additionally, in most cases, uh, a policy response, which I will describe um, in a minute. But I think the story so far is important because it explains how and why any spending authorised by Parliament will happen without any constraint. If no additional policy response is undertaken, then that spending will simply be expressed um, as an increase in the Ways and Means account or on the held at the bank by the National Loans Fund. Okay, but there is typically um, a response that, that's undertaken, and that is what we describe as cash management. Um, so cash management 
um, represents the trading of trading of government trading of government securities by the debt management office. And I think I think it's important to understand that this is a policy response. Now, everything I've described so far with respect to spending has has had its crucial aspects rooted in legislation. Cash management is is motivated by um, Her Majesty's Treasury's uh, policy, basically. And so, from that perspective, it's 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 a lot more discretionary. Now, the the process of cash management is usually construed as a borrowing exercise motivated by the need to provision government. Um, and and we, we question that framing completely. As, as we've seen, government doesn't need to provision itself in order to, to spend. Um, so that's clearly not the motivation. Uh, and instead, the debt management, the debt management officers cash management remit is, is simply to, to offset the government's financial flows. Now, if we look back at how cash management was undertaken, prior to the debt management office being established in 1998, we see that it was done with an eye on the Bank of England's monetary policy objectives. That is um, with a view to restore some sort of perceived balance to the banking system in lieu of the various daily flows across the, the, the banking sector's balance sheets, um, including but not limited to um, those flows produced by the government. So we think it's better to see cash management as kind of um, a hygiene process. It's, it's, the, it's the government tidying up after itself. Um, the Treasury's policy for the debt management office today is for the debt management office to completely offset any daily exchequer deficit or surplus um, by trading in government securities by the end of each day. And what this means is that the ways and means account that I just described is, is to be avoided. Um, and, and that essentially means that any debt that the Exchequer has to the Bank of England um, is converted to tradable debt that is held outside of the, uh, held outside of the Bank of England um, within the day. I should say that that ultimately depends on um, the Bank of England's own operations, which may, of course, as we, as we see today, um, buy back that debt. Um, um, Current practice is also for the debt management account to hold a positive balance, which is not expected to, to vary from day to day. So in order to just um, describe that a little bit further, we can add to the, this diagram the debt management account now at the Bank of England, um, and we can see um, how flows occur between the banking sector and the debt management account according to market activities. Um, and then ultimately, the debt management account's job is to transfer money either to or from the National Loans Fund in order to offset that net exchequer position. Uh, okay, so here we have two cash management scenarios. Along the top is the case of a daily exchequer deficit, and on the bottom, a, a daily exchequer surplus. Um, so along the top, in the first step, as we've as I described before, we've got the consolidated fund and the national loans fund starting the day with a nil balance, whereas the debt management account um, always always has to, always aims to have um, a particular fixed um, positive balance. Um, so during the day, activities on the consolidated fund and the national loans fund can cause variations in their balances, but at the end of the day, the consolidated fund is swept into the national loans fund. And this represents that net exchequer position that the debt management office um, it's, has the task of offsetting. So in this case, on the top, um, uh, it, it has a, it, in, in number three, it has a, a deficit on the National Loans Fund to try to offset. So it achieves that by selling securities and increasing its own balance to the extent that it can make, make the required transfer to the National Loans Fund. Um, that's in step four, and then in step one, once step once the money has been transferred to the national loans fund, we see at the end in step five the national loans fund is at zero, and the debt management account is back to its target level. Um, on the bottom, we've got the case of an exchequer surplus. Uh, this is pretty similar, except in this case the debt management office needs to buy securities, buy government securities back from the private sector, in order to try and dispose of the cash surplus that that. That was um, 
sitting on the National Loans Fund at the end of the day. Okay, so what's the significance of this? Um, well, I guess it, it, it's, it's tempting to view the debt management office as funding the exchequer's spending. Um, and that, that's, that's, that's an understandable viewpoint when, you, when you're taking a sort of a, a, lo a long distance viewpoint in the sense that the debt sales that are made by the debt management office each day are intended to match the deficit for that day. But the structure of the exchequer in the way that we've described it, um, we think produces very different implications for understanding the constraints on the government in comparison to the, the, the standard viewpoint uh, that you often hear where, whereby the government's spending has to be pre-funded. Um, and the differences are, I mean, first, firstly, um, the exchequer's spending does, or at least certainly can, happen before the debt management office does, does anything. Um, and, and, and it happens without any obstacle. The cash management activities of the debt management office has, has no impact on whether the, the, the government spending um, happens. Um, so nothing stands in the way of, 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 the expect, of, of, of the exchequer spending into the banking system. Um, it's not dependent on, on the debt management office's activities at all. Um, secondly, uh, as explained by the Bank of England about half a century ago, and described in the the quote on the in the bottom right there, the banking the banking sector itself will always purchase any securities which need to be sold, according to policy requirements, by the end of each day, and that's because they are by definition holding excess funds by virtue of the the exchequer's spending that day. Um, and they would reflexively want to seek to put those excess funds to their best advantage, which would, which would usually be to switch them from reserves to government securities. So in that sense, the debt management office isn't uh, faced with, you know, a, a market holding scarce funds and seeking to bid up the prices that are charged to the government, as is commonly depicted. But instead, the requirement for the debt management office to sell securities is matched identically by the banking sector's excess money balances. Um, which were produced by the, the 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 exchequer spending that day, and so in that sense, there are no bond vigilantes as are commonly invoked, and that also explains why the Ways and Means account is is after all um, scarcely actually required. Okay, so I'll. I think finish up by just making a few remarks about um, tax and national insurance. Um, uh, it's comparatively straightforward compared to the, the expenditure um, uh, system that I just described earlier. Um, uh, now, tax is collected, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, by the Government Banking Service commercial partner, Barclays. Um, and so on the screen, we can see here a tax payment being settled from a taxpayer's bank, Lloyd's in this case, into an account at Barclays. The next step is that a transfer is made across the Bank of England, the accounts at the Bank of England into HMRC's account uh, within Government Banking Service. And finally, as I think I mentioned earlier, um, that those tax receipts are, are shifted to the consolidated fund by the end of the day. And as we, as I, as I showed earlier, you know, the, the the, the, the tax receipts that are transferred to the consolidated fund um, may serve to offset a, a spending deficit that was already on the consolidated fund, or in some cases will produce a surplus on the consolidated fund. Now, national insurance is, is, is actually slightly different. Uh, there's a slight nuance with national insurance. National insurance does not have to be surrendered to the consolidated fund by law, and it has its own separate statutory authority. Um, now, national insurance has responsibility for paying out certain social security benefits, such as the state pension. And many folk consider the national insurance fund to represent kind of like, like a pre-funded hypothecated tax. Um, that is that there's a, there's a pot of money to which they have contributed to and from which their pension and, and other, um, other benefits are paid. Um, now, it is true that the national insurance fund has 
a large amount of wealth. And according to the accounts that were produced last March, that is 39 billion pounds. Um, but actually that does not represent anything other than an internal record within the Exchequer. The reason being that, as you can see on the screen there, national insurance um, contributions, when they arrive in the Exchequer, um, they are simply sent to the debt management account. Now, what does the debt management account do? Uh, it does the cash management and it always seeks to have a constant balance each day. It's not, it's not, it's not retaining surplus receipts. Uh, to the extent that there are surplus receipts, they are re recycled back into the banking sector. So, so the, the, the contributions that are received by the Exchequer for national insurance are not retained as cash, but they're submitted to the debt management account where they are recycled, uh, but, but, but recorded as a deposit in the debt management account. So the 39 billion wealth of the national insurance fund is a deposit inside the exchequer um now so it's not it's not money as we would as we would see it it's not cash at the bank of england it's not a commercial bank deposit but in some senses it's better than that it's a claim on the consolidated fund which as hopefully i've demonstrated um earlier is as good as is as good as cash by virtue of the exchequer and audit departments act 1866 so there's a couple of things that we would comp conclude regarding tax and national insurance. One is that taxes don't really fund spending in the, in, the, in the way that is commonly invoked, but they do help to mitigate the potential effects of spending uh, on the banking sector, as, I, as in they're another function that, co this, that causes an offset of, of, of the spending uh, within the banking sector, just like the cash management activities. But also since, the since tax has to be submitted legally, uh, to the consolidated fund and since the consolidated fund uh, is is an account at the bank of england this means the taxes are ultimately settled in bank of england money they're not settled uh, using commercial bank deposits at all in instead commercial banks act as the agents of taxpayers in settling tax payments on their behalf using central bank money and i guess the significance of this is that simply the need to be able to settle taxpayers tax payments into into the consolidated fund means that there will be um, a, de a demand for central bank money, um, and therefore there needs to be a sufficient supply of central bank money or government securities, which are the medium of exchange typically used for obtaining central bank money, um, in order for tax payments to be able to be made. Um, and the national insurance fund effectively functions exactly like everything else in the exchequer via issues being made from the consolidated fund and surplus receipts being recycled back into the banking sector. Um, there are some additional accounting nuances that are simply internal to the exchequer that help to account for national insurance, but, but that's about it. It's, it's not a, it's not, there isn't a big pile of cash, um, you know, that, that represents the national insurance fund sitting anywhere. Uh, and so I think I think that's about as much as um, I thought I would have time to say. Um, and it looks like I'm about on time, if maybe slightly over. But I, I'd say I think in general our conclusions um, would be that spending is guaranteed by Parliament, parliamentary authority, uh, and it's not constrained by you know balances or other or other banking arrangements, contrary to what is is often invoked, at least in public discourse, maybe not by slightly better informed um, folk in the, in the economics community. Um, but equally, the, 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 the popular conceptualization of government borrowing is also pretty questionable. The government's not beholden to mark, market sentiment, at least not most of the time. Um, and government securities, we would argue, function more as a, as a form of money used by the private sector rather than a debt that you know reflexively needs to be repaid um so i'll leave it there if that's okay and we can we can move on thanks very much andrew that was that was great um i feel privileged to have uh, been one of the first people to have seen that